Happy New Year. We are at the end of November. Last week in November, we entered the season of Advent, which brings us, of course, to a new church year. And we are entering Series C in the three-year lectionary. So the gospel readings during this year that you come to church, most Sundays are going to be from the Gospel of Luke. John gets interspersed along in there throughout all three of the series A, B, and C. But mostly this year will be in Luke which is very fitting for us because we're entering in the Advent season and looking forward to celebrating Christmas. Matthew and Luke give us the account of Jesus' birth and the history of Jesus' birth and tell us how that all came to to take place. So it's a wonderful thing for us to be able to do together. We will do the, the... the Gospel of Luke through this year. And I know I've been been off for a couple weeks because two weeks ago I went home and stayed home for a couple extra days to be with mom. And then, so I missed that week of Thanksgiving. And then, then also, of course, I didn't get back till the Tuesday of that week. And we've entered into the Advent season. So we're going to do our best to keep up with this because we want to try to get through the birth of Christ in this month since we're in the season of Advent and we've already come Next week, or t- tomorrow, rather, of course, there is a, an, another Advent service. Our third Advent service is, a, our second Advent service, rather, is going to be tomorrow evening. And 6 o'clock is the service itself, dinner at 5 o'clock, if you want to come and join us for that. But we'll begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we praise you for the revelation of your word and especially that in your word we find joy in the gift of Christ our Savior. And as we prepare our hearts during this season of Advent, we look forward to celebrating not simply his first coming in Bethlehem, but we pray that you would make us ready for the day he comes again to judge the living and the dead and take his church home. Be with us in all that we do and say that it be to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we could do Luke is, of course, the longest of the Gospels. It is not by chapter count, but by word count, the longest of the Gospels. And there are a number of things, even though Luke is considered a synoptic Gospel. In other words, it kind of takes a view of the same uh, the same accounts that Matthew and Mark do. John's John's very different, focuses is, is a little different, but uh, there, there's a lot of kinds of emphases that we see in the Gospel of Luke that are unique to it. And we'll try to pick those out along the way. We won't spend a a lot of time on the front end talking about this. Of course, Luke doesn't tell us in the prologue that he is the author. We know that from from Luke together is the first volume of a two-volume work that was written by Luke in called and the second volume being the Acts of the Apostles. Luke was one of the fellow travelers along with Paul. You meet him in Acts, in the in the, the book of Acts, when it talks about Luke, uh, Luke as one of his, his travel people that traveled and assisted his ministry. And so in a way, Luke is also probably a scribe for St. Paul and writing down the words that he is proclaiming, that he is sharing. And what else to say about Luke? We, you know, church tradition tells us that Luke is a physician. When we get to some of the healing accounts, some of that will will come out in the way that he describes it, as opposed to how um, somebody who isn't a medical person would would approach it. So that's a different kind of a aspect of Luke's work that he's a physician. So uh, Luke's gospel is generally thought of as being a, a gospel written to the Gentiles. And specifically to a Gentile named Theophilus that we're going to meet in these in these opening verses. Inasmuch, so Luke chapter 1, verse 1, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered to us, them to us, it seemed good to me also having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may certainly you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So one of the neat things I think about the, the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, is that, that they were in the process of being written. Luke's probably around 50, 55 A.D., 
um, and, and all of the other gospels also written before the fall of, of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. But so this is probably within 20 years. These are firsthand accounts. And it's interesting how Luke approaches it because he says that um, uh, he's writing a narrative or arranging a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. So not only is, is he writing as one who has, in, has been an eyewitness to these events, but that he's been closely touched and in connection with those who are eyewitnesses of these events. And Luke, and Luke has, is, is taking it upon himself to arrange these for Theophilus. Who is Theophilus? We do not know. It could be that he was a, a rich man, maybe a benefactor that was supportive of the, the proclamation of the gospel. It could be that Theophilus is he certainly is a Gentile. It's a Gentile name, and the name just means a lover of God. It could be that that, that name Theophilus is being used as almost a, a, a way of saying that this gospel is really to all those who are lovers of God. And he's using this, this character as a way of saying, I'm writing it to you, but it's for all of those who consider themselves lovers of God. But we don't know if it's a, an historical person, Theophilus. We don't know a lot about who he is, only that Luke wants him to have certainty regarding the things that he has been taught. That word catechism, catecheo, is in there. The things that you have been taught is in that word sounded down. That's there's a that the teaching was speaking things back and forth. And Luke Luke wants to put these things into writing. I think it's one of the great things about the early churches is, is the gospel was was able to be authenticated as as the Holy Spirit is inspiring the writing of these scriptures. There are people there that can hear them and receive them and say, okay, this one is authentic. This is a genuine gospel that produces the truth of God's word, and this one can be relied upon. So there were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word that delivered it to us. It's also interesting. We know that the Bible is, in all of its parts, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter 1 says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that would include also these scriptures that are that Luke has set his hand to writing. But it's not, we want to think of it maybe in a less mechanical way, because sometimes people imagine the process of inspiration almost as though the author, in this case, Luke, went into some kind of a trance and his hand just moved to put to page the words that were written, but it, it's, it's clear that while the Holy Spirit's the one who guides the, the writing of Holy Scriptures, he makes use of the study and the interviewing of the eyewitnesses and, the, and getting down what the good news is, almost like a good reporter that's, that's going to tell the account of how it actually happened, that the Holy Spirit guides through that, but it doesn't take over or, or eclipse the, the unique kind of personality traits that come through in each of the gospel writers. They're writing their own gospel as the Holy Spirit guides them. So it's it's these things that have been accomplished among us. And again, this is volume one of a two volume. Luke is, uh, Acts is going to be the second volume of those. But he regards these from the outset as the, the things that have been accomplished, the works of our salvation have been accomplished. They have been, I think the word is pleroforia, or, um, that they have been fulfilled, that, that they've been accomplished among us. That means all the prophecies of the Old Testament, that God had arranged things and, and fulfilled them as he had promised. So it seems good to Luke also to sit down and, and write an orderly account for to write an orderly account for Theophilus or any lover of God, certainly that would include us. So, you know, it, you, often you will come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, especially Matthew, Mark, Luke, and say, well, which one of them really is? They they do seem, I would suggest probably Luke's is the most chronological. I don't know the answer to that necessarily, but probably his is the most chronological. 
but it, it seems to me reading through the gospels that they are arranged um, more in, a, in for doctrinal purposes than necessarily being in the correct chronological order. In other words, he puts the accounts where they go because he's building toward an emphasis that he wants to highlight. So it's another way that people would would write any, I mean, that you would would tell the history of something by by themes as opposed to chronology. But I think Luke is probably the most chronologically oriented of the Gospels. Um, willing to be wrong on that. The Holy Spirit can let us know in, in that great day. So that you may have certainty regarding the, the things you've been taught. I'd just say about that, you know, faith is, and I'll always know this from Hebrews 11 verse 1 in the NIV, which is how I learned it. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. So God does not want us to kind of vacillate somewhere in the range of, well, it might be true, it could be true, or this might really be how it happened. God wants us to be certain. And that is the that is what is the motivating factor here behind Luke's writing it, so that you may have certainty. It's not enough for, for us to say, well, maybe it happened. God wants us to be sure because that's what faith is. It is a living confidence in God's word and his promises such that we're willing, as Luther would say it in his, his introduction to the book of Romans, that it's faith is a living, active confidence that would, would bet your life on it a thousand times. It's that kind of an assurance. And, and so Luke writes so that, that Theophilus can have certainty. In the days of Herod, king of Judea. Now, this is a, one of the things you'll notice about all the Gospels. Luke especially, Luke is a very dedicated and, and attentive historian. This comes out even more completely and, and obviously in, in the book of Acts. But Luke is, is an historian and doesn't, he, he wants to bring us into the world of where these things actually happened. So Luke's gospel is, is different than, say, the Aesop's fables or fairy tales or, or the Quran or those kinds of things where, you know, we might start with long ago in a faraway place. You know, yeah, <laughs> excuse me. That kind of language you would, would assume is somebody's telling a fairy tale. They're not trying to be too specific. Luke is not. He wants, he's talking about historical personages that can be traced, that you can know that this is real living. This is the world of fact. It's not the world of fable and make-believe. So in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. Now, uh, Herod reigned from about 37 to 4 BC. Now, some people see, oddly enough, some people will, will say that Herod died in 4 BC could be, which would seem odd to us, but that would mean Christ died sometime before 4 BC, or Christ was born rather sometime before 4 BC. And that would, we have to understand that is whenever the church tried to go back and, and trace to the time of Jesus' birth, that maybe they got some bad information. I don't know. I mean, I'll leave that in the mists of history a little bit, but we are told that Herod died in 4 BC. So, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. Now, if you look in, in 1 Chronicles 24, in 1 Chronicles 24, King David arranges the, the ministry of the priests. He's, he's taking it upon himself to prepare for, the, for Solomon, his son, to build the temple. And he is arranging for the service of the priest. And there are 24 orders of priests. And the, the order of Abijah, or the division of Abijah, as Luke says it here, is number eight in that line. So in they would serve for a week at a time. And then they would go home. And then they would come back whenever the 24, then the, you know, the, at whenever their next time of service came back around after the 24 and after number seven, there'd come the service of Abijah. It's time to, to go to, to do your priestly duty at the temple. 
Now, Zechariah was an elderly man in the, serve, in the division of Abijah, and it said he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. So likewise, she's a Levite also. She's from the daughters of Aaron too. So they're both from the priestly clan. And her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God. They, of course, the just, the righteous shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2 verse 4 says they were righteous before God. They were believers in the promises and looking forward to the fulfillment of the promises that God has made, had made to his people Israel. They were righteous and they were both walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. They were God's faithful people. They were believers and, and looked forward to the promise being fulfilled, and they walked the walk. They followed the commandments of the Lord. They were zealous for, for their faith and lived that faith. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. So that's kind of a dissonant tone you might think in this picture is, is Zechariah is already an old man. He's serving as a priest in, in the temple. And his wife, Elizabeth, was is already an old woman, and she's barren. She's unable to have a child. And, you know, this is not the first time we've heard this in Holy Scripture. In fact, there are seven women that, that were barren and that miraculously that God opened their wombs to have children. Um, I should say, let me see, there's, there's Sarah, of course, Abraham, Sarah. Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, um, there is Manoah, the, the Manoah's wife, um, the mother of Samson. There is Elkanah's wife. Um, there's Elkanah's wife, who is, is I don't know if I, I should have done this the right way. Okay, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, there is Manoah's wife, there is Hannah, then there is then there is Elizabeth, and these that God has opened their wounds, her wombs, her, these barren women, and heard their prayer and opened their wombs. Now the seventh miracle child that's born in Scripture is going to be born of the Virgin Mary. So you know the seven being that number of completion in in Scripture. It's interesting that the the six and then the the seventh is the greatest of them all, the greatest miracle birth of them all, because the seventh doesn't involve the, the participation of a father in the way that all the others did. But here we have Zechariah and Elizabeth. They had no child because she was barren. Okay? And, and we'll see, see in a moment that in those days to have no child, would children were regarded and ought to still be regarded as a blessing. Read Psalm 127, 128, and see how God regards the Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Um, and filling the your quiver with arrows is like the, the sons born to, to one's home. So children are blessings from God and ought to be regarded as that. In the same way, very often in that time, somebody who didn't kind of was thought, well, you know, for whatever reason, God wasn't blessing them. And that would be kind of a terrible stigma to, to live with too and wonder why. But now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, that's the eighth division, the division of Abijah, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. That would have been an extraordinarily uncommon thing, I think, to be chosen by lot. You know, it's a roll of the dice, and if it falls to you, well, it, it, in this particular time, it the, the lot fell to Zechariah to go in and burn incense in the temple. Now, we have the whole, most holy place, or the holy of holies, is the inner sanctum of the temple with the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim facing one another, and then the holy place is, is on the other side of the curtain, and that's the part where the priests would go in and burn incense at the time of the daily sacrifices, morning and evening sacrifice. Now, the most holy place, only the high priest would enter in that once a year to offer a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement for the sins of the people. But this, this burning of incense at the time of prayer 
would have been a, a daily occurrence. And Zechariah was chosen by Lot to enter the holy place, that first little compartment in the temple, and to burn incense there. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the altar of incense. So this is kind of a beautiful, we think of all of Israel and the the outpouring of their prayers, lifting up to God as the incense, that my prayers rise before you as incense, Psalm 141 says, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So the prayers are, are of the people are wafting up to God and that being symbolized by Zechariah in the temple burning the incense while the people are outside praying. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense, you know, in our in our in our altar, in our church architecture, the right side of the altar is regarded as the gospel side of the altar. And that's why you see often it doesn't have to be, but why you see often the move from the reading of the Old Testament and the epistle to move to the right side of the altar for the reading of the gospel lesson. So there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Well, you, that is not surprising to me. It would shock a person. It would stop your heart to see you whenever you're in there doing your work. And it's a solemn enough work and an important enough work anyway. And, and then all of a sudden to find that an angel of the Lord is there before you. But it might also be that, frankly, that the angels, that we might, in our little greeting cards you send out, we think of the angels as being chubby little cute fat babies with wings and everything. But the angels are God's warriors, so they, they might have been quite a an imposing and impressive appearance. So a fear fell upon Zechariah. He's troubled when he sees the angel. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, right? Fear not, Zechariah. So those those words of of comfort to allow his heart to stop be, start beating again that don't be afraid for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son now i like that part of it because he says your prayer has been heard now i suppose it is possible that zechariah has even until that time continued to pray for the gift of a child along with his wife Elizabeth although you're going to hear in a few seconds that Zechariah, he doesn't believe it's even possible because his wife's old and, and uh, you know, how can I know? You know, I'm an old man. So it, it may be that these prayers they lifted up throughout their life when they were young enough. And who knows, maybe they still were. But I think it's certainly possible that, you know what, God answers prayer in his time. We know that God answers all prayer. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. And sometimes the answer is be patient. So if if Zechariah and Elizabeth, when they were still young and able to have children or thought they could have children, prayed, it took God a long time to, to answer it. And but this is how this is how the angel portrays it. He says, Do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard your wife, Elizabeth. So God's heard the prayer. Now is God's time. Now he is going to step in and act, and he has chosen the means through which he was going to act to fulfill the promise of before the Savior could come, before the Messiah could be born, the messenger of the Lord had to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now that's Malachi chapter 3, and we read that in our Old Testament lesson. Um, I think it was last week. Uh, that we read that the promise of God's messenger to come. Well, John the Baptist is going to be that messenger, the Elijah, who is to come and precede the coming of Jesus, our Savior. So your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And indeed, what a Yohanan would be, um, would be what that name would sound like in, in Hebrew, Ioannes in Greek, the word means probably the Lord is gracious or 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 you know, something to that effect. The Lord is gracious. So what a, a beautiful God's heard the prayer of his people. So John is a wonderfully appropriate 
name, the Lord is gracious. You shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. So I love that that kind of uh, superlative expression, joy and rejoicing and gladness, that this child is going to be finally God's promises are coming true. The Messiah is going to be born. So joy, joy, joy. And this is, you know, that's our, this is Joy Sunday in, in our our readings in church this Sunday, that John is going to be the source of great joy, not simply for Zechariah and Elizabeth, but shock and joy for all of those neighbors that were, were wondering, we're going to wonder about what's this child going to be after all. And then, of course, he's going to prepare the way for Jesus. Now, we're going to see that John's life doesn't end in the most joyous way, but that's part of the part of the history that we'll, we'll have before us. He, you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, at the birth of John the Baptist, because God is keeping his promises. Something He's doing something new and something unique, something that he's promised in his holy scriptures is going to be fulfilled, for he will be great before the Lord, and great in, in the sense that he is going to be that promised messenger that goes before the Lord, and great also filled with the Holy Spirit, great in that he's going to be great in his by by his preaching is going to prepare so many all <laughs> excuse me hearts for the coming of their savior. Excuse me. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. So the the Nazarites of, of, of among whom Samson fit into that category also the Nazarites were those that were dedicated and set apart to the Lord and that were they weren't to drink wine and strong drink and have anything to do with that stuff this just embodies the the that John is consecrated to God from the womb for the task that God has set him apart to fulfill and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb so filled with the Holy Spirit is is it's beautiful. Sometimes we think, was, you know, even inside of his mama, he's got faith in his Savior. The Holy Spirit's rested resting upon him, and uh, you know, we some sometimes people think, well, can a child have faith, or can an infant be a believer? Well, not in the sense probably that you can give them a confirmation exam and they can answer all the questions correctly, but can a child be saved and be a believer filled with the Holy Spirit? Absolutely, because that faith is a living trust that comes from God the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not the same as simply having the knowledge of a bunch of facts. It's something that's born of God. Even from his mother's womb, he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, their God. And he will go before, before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. There it is, the, the promise of the, the one who's to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So this is going to be the, the work that God gives John the Baptist to do. He's not going just going through the motions, but he's to make people in in his preaching of law to call people to repentance, to drive them to their knees, and in his preaching of the gospel to point them to Christ the Savior. And Malachi three says, and this is the Malachi is the last of our writings of the Old Testament. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? For he is like a refiner's fire when he appears. Uh, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Um, so he goes on to talk about the way that, that he is going to, through his preaching of law and gospel, and it doesn't use that language of preaching of law and gospel, but through the preaching of repentance, to draw the hearts of people to be ready, a people prepared. Remember Isaiah 40 says, said, 
the voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. That's his job. John the Baptist is going to go before Jesus. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? Now, I think Zechariah it feels like he gets a, a raw deal here. And you know, it's kind of mystifies me in a way, but it seems like he says the same thing Mary does, but she gets off a little bit, uh, gets a little break. But it must be that whatever that was the, the tenor of his question to the angel, that it possibly came off as sounding like, well, that's that's impossible. He says, how can how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. So it would seem to indicate to me he probably had stopped praying about the time maybe maybe his wife Elizabeth had gone through menopause and just thought, well, it's not going to happen for us. But God's got his time to answer prayers. So my wife's well advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Okay, so he's, he's bringing good news. God's keeping his promises. It's good news in the sense Zechariah and Elizabeth can have a baby, but it's good news in that God is, it is the, the fullness of time had come and God is keeping his promises to the children of Israel in, in, in the sending of the Messiah that he had long before promised. I am Gabriel. Of course, Gabriel, we meet first in Daniel. In Daniel chapter, well, in in Daniel chapter nine, the Gabriel Gabriel is the angel Gabriel speaks there, and also in in Daniel chapter ten, and we meet in we meet Michael, who's the angel of God's people in in Daniel chapter ten. Also, um, Daniel talks a lot about angels, but. Uh, these so these two Michael and and Gabriel along with of course the devil are the only angels mentioned by name in, in the Bible. The devil of course is a fallen angel. He and his pride rebelled against God. But Gabriel and Michael are are what what we often call archangels. And you could look at let me see Tobit twelve. I think I have to look in in your apocrypha. If you look at the in the Apocrypha, it talks about um, a third angel. The Apocrypha is kind of is regarded by Lutherans and by the early church even as is very useful and good and important writings, but not of the same. They are a secondary um, of a secondary level of importance to in Holy Scripture. Other than Holy Scripture, they're of a secondary level of importance. Luther regarded them as important. He translated them for his his Bible. They were part of the translation of, of the Apocrypha was included there. The In Tobit 12, it includes a third angel, Raphael. And then um, First Enoch, verse 20, talks about the, there being seven angels. And I don't know if it lists them as archangels or not, but we generally, it, the church kind of, you talk about things maybe we shouldn't talk about sometimes because we don't know. But the church is, is kind of traditionally numbered the archangels as seven. And then among them, Raphael, who's mentioned in, in Tobit 12. But then in First Enoch 20, it also lists Ariel, Raphael, Serachiel, Raguel, Michael, Gabriel, and Remiel. Right? Those are only mentioned they're in in well you know they're probably mentioned other places but first enoch 20 we call uh pseudepigrapha because it's it's the name that's appended to it really isn't the name that of of the actual guy that we know as enoch but that's a whole other story okay so gabriel anyway is we view him and understand him as being one of the archangels and he's very prominent in scripture along with michael so um, I have to find out where I am now. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, 
and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. So, you know, Gabriel is very important. He's a a messenger of the good news of Jesus Christ. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Now, that could be regarded as as he's giving him a sign. Zechariah wants to know, how can I know? Well, here's, here's a clue for you. You're not going to be able to talk from now on. But the rest of it kind of makes it seem like there is a little bit of a, not just I'm going to give you the sign that you're a mute, but rather he says, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. So there seems to be a little bit of a reproof in there or or a correction to his unbelief, which, I mean, it's hard hard to hard to blame Zechariah for being a little incredulous, being told he and his old and his old maid uh, of a wife are going to have children. But that's how it goes, because you did not believe from now on, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be, you're not going to be able to speak until the naming of this child, until the, these words are fulfilled. So meanwhile, Zechariah is inside the temple, he's burning incense, and he's having this dialogue, which I imagine is, is, punctuated by a lot of pauses and shock uh, on the part of Zechariah. But uh, outside the temple, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering at his delay in the temple. In other words, the liturgy of the temple was pretty regimented. You didn't get to, to fly by the seat of your pants. It's not like a modern contemporary worship service where just whatever you feel like doing is gonna is is what you do next. It is uh, there's a liturgy you follow and and this comes after that and then you come out. There are rubrics and everything else. So they wonder what's up with Zechariah? What's taking him so long? And finally he comes out and the people and when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. So maybe it was somehow through his his expressions and the signs that he was making to them that they came to realize nah, he saw something in there. There's something going on that that uh, he encountered while he was in there. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And if, sadly for him, he can't jump in and tell Elizabeth the good news. However, he could write it down. He could spend his time sending little love notes to his wife and tell him this is what the angel said would happen. And and after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. So like the first six, okay, this this miraculous birth of John the Baptist is miraculous enough in its own right. She was an old woman, he was an old man, but it still happened the way births normally happen, uh, an earthly mom and an earthly dad bear an earthly son. So on the other hand, the next one, the birth of Christ, is going to be utterly the seventh uh, miracle baby in Scripture is going to be utterly unlike anything else because it's going to be Mary conceiving by the power of the Holy Spirit with no aid and no help from Joseph at all. So thus she kept herself hidden for five months. You know, very often people would do that even today. Whenever whenever they are find out that they're going to have a baby that maybe they don't just go out and share it right away because maybe they're afraid that, that they're going to lose the child and and they don't want to have to answer questions about it, whether that was what is going on here or not. But she kept herself hidden for five months and then finally let other people know about it, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach among the people. Now, whether that reproach was real in from the eyes of her peers or for her the neighboring women or for the other people, that they would have looked at Zechariah and Elizabeth and thought, Oh, you know, you're you're under God's judgment, because, or whether that's something that she felt that that she felt in and of herself, which which I think is, you know, probably more likely. It's hard to imagine such godly people as Zechariah and Elizabeth that anybody would look at them and think that they were under God's judgment. But I can understand how Elizabeth would have carried that loss of the not having a child with her through all those years and thought. 
that she herself, that for some reason God was holding her back from the receiving of that gift that she prayed for for so long. Well, finally, here it is. Now that that prayer is going to be answered, even though, you know, humanly speaking, the, the clock has ticked midnight and yet and yet God's going to intervene. So for five months, she keeps quiet. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, this is we're going to go through here and maybe I should just stop here pretty soon. But um, this is one of the things that you're going to notice about the Gospel of Luke is the cycle of kind of reversals, the unexpected. And that is really in all of the Gospels to some extent, but uh, that Luke really is, is this, he turns everything on its head and ev everything is, the way that God acts is not in line with what most people think of. And and that's, you know, Paul talks about that in first Corinthians, that uh, the wisdom of the world is, is pales in comparison to the wisdom of God, that God's wisdom makes the, the brilliance and the wisdom of man, it's just puny compared to God. So, so, you know, who would expect to have any part in the history of salvation? Two old people, you know, that have, have gone through one that's gone through menopause and that time is, is no longer possible for them. But God flips it over on its head. Now you consider, sitter, Gabriel goes to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Nazareth is now. This is going to be the is in fulfillment of of God's prophecy that, that on those in the valley of the shadow of death that a great light has dawned and the promise of of Jesus being born and growing up in Nazareth. But Nazareth was a nothing, really. It was it was a nothing of a kind of a town, and you know, for for Jesus to come from there, it's. You know, at least Bethlehem has a, um, you know, he had to be born in Bethlehem, according to the prophecy of Ma Micah chapter 5. But Nazareth, I mean, you know, little town in Galilee, big deal. But that's how God works. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Now, is, Luke is in great pains to emphasize through this part of the account that she's a virgin. She's never had relations with Joseph or with any man, but she is betrothed. That is kind of like an engagement, except more binding. You, are, you would have been considered married even during this betrothal period. And for, the, for somebody to be released from that, they would have to be given a certificate of divorce to, to, for that engagement to be broken. So it was very much like our marriage, except that the sexual relations were still a no-no. The betrothal period generally was also a time for the man to get working on the house that he's going to bring his his wife into so that he could be working on that. And once the wedding came, then he would be ready to set up a household. So this virgin is betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. So Joseph of the house of David, going to be important because Joseph is, is from the family of King David. King David, even, even while Joseph is not the, strictly speaking, Joseph is not the father of Jesus. The way that they reckoned the father would be, or the, the kind of official reckoning of like the king, David begets Solomon, Solomon and, and Rehoboam, and, and that it went through the father when they counted the, the king's list. So Joseph is of the family of of. King David also. So even though he's not really the father of Christ, we're going to see uh, that, that Mary in her, her, she is from the tribe of, of David also, or from the tribe of Judah also. So both of them are from the tribe of Judah, just as, as Zechariah and Elizabeth were both from the tribe of Levi. But you know, J Joseph is going to be that whenever they reckon the kings, they reckon the kings down from their father. So even though we know Jesus 
true father is God the Father in heaven. He receives his human um, of the his human flesh through the fruit of Mary's womb. So it's important that Mary also is of the tribe of David or of the tribe of Judah from the from the house of David, whose name was was Joseph of the house of David. Okay, David's the great greatest king of Israel. That's the kingly line. That's the line Jesus is going to be born to. Second Samuel seven. God promised David that somebody from his son was going to, which we know is is immediately fulfilled in Solomon. But this son of David is going to reign as a king. And then when he starts talking about he's going to reign on an eternal, never-ending throne, we recognize, oh yeah, this son of David that that's really being prophesied here in Second Samuel 7 can't just be Solomon because Solomon was 40 years and done, but had to be fulfilled by Jesus, who's the true King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the Virgin's name was Mary. Of course, our, our you know, we get a lot of our words through the Latin Vulgate, the, the Roman Catholic Church in the, in the West. The Vulgate, Latin Vulgate kind of became the Eastern Church used Greek, and Mariam, Mariam, was was the name for Mary. That is the name Miriam. You might recognize Moses' sister was named Miriam. Mary's name was Mar- Miriam. That was her real name. We it, in the Latin Vulgate that's translated Maria, and that's why we we have so many people that are called Mary because. Because the Latin West tended to utilize the Vulgate and the Latin language more than the Greek language, and certainly way more than than the Hebrew language, which would have been Mara, I think. But uh, but anyway, so it, it's interesting to me that you think of of Mary's name is is Mary. It's, it's the same name as Moses' sister. Moses' sister is the one who who you know they put baby Moses into the reeds and. And she watched over and and watched to make sure that baby was safely brought into the the princess of the pharaoh and and Moses went home with the pharaoh and and then Mary Miriam was there to watch over and make sure he keep him safe and then go back and get Miriam and Moses' mom and Aaron's mom and that mother ends up taking care of Moses. So there's something beautiful about the 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 virgin's name is is Miriam because Mary Miriam watched over baby Moses who's going to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt. Miriam that is the virgin Mary is is the one whom God entrusts Jesus to and she watches over him and brings him safely into the world and and so the virgin's name was Mary. We get Mary from the the Latin and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. So um, it's also the same, but we say the Lord be with you. It's the greeting we use in church. This is Gabriel's greeting to her. O favored one or graced one. God's undeserved love has been poured out upon you. Greetings. And that word for greetings is joy. Kyra, joy. And it's rejoicing, rejoice, greetings. And it's it's pretty uh, you know sadly the greetings kind of empties it of of the rejoice that that all this birth of the savior is accompanied with such great joy greetings you favored one you who are graced by god the lord is with you and that is certainly true in that she's a child of god and and has god's favor and love but it's is is with her in, in a unique and heightened sense The Lord is with her because she's going to be carrying the Lord in her womb. The Lord is with her. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You know, I think that we've reached about 50 minutes here. So I'm going to I'm going to stop here and then we can go into this this dialogue of gabriel and mary starting at verse 30 next time so uh join us for church tomorrow we've got we've carried through these last couple advent services and then looking forward to our our christmas celebration 
these services we are going to try to the best of our ability to get on to get them to be able to be posted at some point i don't know if the you know christmas eve service will be on the 24th at 4 30 and 11 the candlelight service and then uh, the christmas day service at 10 christmas day and then on the 26th, the Feast of Stephen is 10 o'clock, a normal Sunday service on, at 10 o'clock. So I encourage you to make those a part of your worship life. Make all of those a part of your journey toward the celebration of the birth of the Savior. And that will we'll close. Lord, we thank you for, for sending Jesus, our Savior. We thank you for the ways that you prepared the world for that great coming. And we pray that you would prepare our hearts also through the message of John and through the message of the prophets, prepare our hearts to celebrate with joy our Redeemer and Lord. Amen.